Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Banshi. I have to thank a lot of people for the success of this, this particular 13th edition of the World Diabetes India Congress. I think uh, a lot of names to be taken, but I just take a few names who really worked extremely well. Dr. Banshi, of course, is there as the secretary, ably supported by the scientific chair, Dr. Manoj. Bharat Sabu has done a wonderful work. Amit has done fantastic work. Dr. Sunil Jain, he's been the guiding force for this particular meet. And of course, all the volunteers and all the support staff, I really would like to thank you. I think after brilliant lectures from uh, Krishna, Makkat, and so many people, it becomes a little difficult to speak anything in the oration. So the topic that was given to me was glucocentric to vascular protection. I will make it short. I just looked at this particular article, quite recent actually, it came out recently. The evolution of type 2 diabetes management from a glucocentric approach to cardiorenal risk reduction, the new paradigm shift. And in fact, this, this, this topic was actually given to me by the scientific chair and said, you are going to speak about this topic. So, there are three eras which has been explained. The first era, of course, is glucocentric. The second era concentrates on the glucocentric, plus, of course, no hypo, no weight gain. And the third era is glucocentric, no hypo, no weight gain, and most importantly, the end organ protection with focus on cardiorenal outcome. So I love watching Netflix. So let's go back to the flashback mode. In 90s, when we started treating patients with diabetes, all the thing that we were worried about was only a good glucose control. In fact, this is all we were talking about, how to educate, how low should be your HbA1c, and what is excellent, what is good, and what is poor when it comes to HbA1c. And we did not have the other things, but Really, if you go back and think about it, because there were so many trials at that time, we learned a huge amount of knowledge which, which told us what should be the HPA1C, what are the problems of good control, poor control, etc., etc. So I'll not go into too many details, but then if you look at this particular slide from UK PDS, it clearly told us Yes, with good control, you have fantastic microvascular protection. But then, if you start it early and watch them over a period of time, which is the legacy effect, you will also probably find a small amount of cardiovascular risk reduction. So, if you look at the glucocentric era, first thing that was told to us was normalize HbA1c. UKPD has clearly told us. And then the intensity of the treatment of the targets. How low should be the HbA1c? So we had Accord, VADT advance, and there was no or minimal macrovascular benefits with, with the reduction of blood sugars. But what we also learned was, lower you go, the more hypoglycemic episodes and weight gain. And Accord was actually stopped due to increase in all-cause mortality. So the lessons from the glucocentric era are listed here very clearly. Start early, the most important thing. If you pick up somebody who already has atherosclerotic changes, then intensive glucose control probably is not going to answer your question. Now, conversely, it's also possible that the potential risk of intensive glycemic control may outweigh the benefits, especially with long duration of diabetes. Severe hypo, advanced atherosclerosis, advanced age and frailty. So you have to be careful. This is the lesson that we actually learned in the glucocentric era. So the message was clear. Avoid hypo, avoid weight gain and individualize targets and advocate controlling non-glycemic risk factors, especially the blood pressure, lipid lowering, statin therapy, aspirin, lifestyle, etc, etc. So the next debate was about selecting the right 
एच बी एवन सी वॉट शुड बी एच बी एवन सी फॉर टाइप वन वॉट शुड बी दच बी एवन सी फॉर टाइप टू वॉट इज राइट वॉट इज रॉन्ग तो मोस्ट ऑफ द गाइडलाइंस फाइनली टोल्डर्स द रीजनेबल गोल ऑफ थेरेपी मे बी एच बी एवन सी अराउंड सेवन इफ पॉसिबल लो विदाउट कॉजिंग हाइपो वेट के ट्राई टू कीप योर फास्टिंग बिटवीन एटी एंड वन थर्टी एंड ब्रांड इयर्स लेस देन वन एटी so most the guidelines did speak about these things now in the second era what we learned from this first era was actually practiced no hypo no weight gain that is when the dpp force had actually come into force so we were able to choose dpp force over self line urea of course insulin continued to give us hypoglycemia so the teaching process was Keep HB A1C around seven. Try to avoid hypo. Aggressively treat blood pressure. Use statins and lifestyle modifications. Comprehensive care and individualized targets. This this became the mantra. It said all diabetics are not going to be the same. So concentrate on comprehensive care and individualize the targets. And there should be an aggressive approach to tackle. modifiable risk factors so when it came to comprehensive care there was a lot of discussion about dietary intervention mental health and so on and so forth so if you look at the guidelines if you look at this ada guideline which i have taken it's been the same for the last 2 3 years comprehensive care shared decision making diabetes is not just about drugs diabetes is about nutrition and lifestyle modification etc etc so the second era was basically concentrating on prevention of complications and to optimize the quality of care and this is what we had and we started talking about traditional aac vd risk factors there was also this slide which spoke about emerging non traditional aac vd risk factors there were things like preterm delivery hypertensive disorders of pregnancy gestational diabetes autoimmune disease breast cancer treatment depression so it was very difficult to really find out so most of the guidelines finally again said look these are the things that you can do as a doctor non modifiable risk factors and modifiable risk factors that this is exactly what we all practice now when we were talking about all these things and the guidelines were coming people started talking about the steno 2 trial which actually did everything that was available at that particular time and still the cardiovascular risk reduction was just 53% so obviously we were missing something there was something that was not really there and if you look at this slide you will be very very shocked this is from the idea for class of 2019 despite doing everything right glycemic control no hypo etc 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 your coronary heart disease is increasing by 160% ischemic heart disease is increasing by 127% hemorrhagic stroke is increasing by 56% cardiovascular death by 132% and of course the years lost this is the data from the idf so people already knew about this data so they were already looking into a number of things so this was actually shocking news that okay you guys are doing everything right but still the problem is not coming down luckily the third era there was a paradigm shift after the cvot trials then we had the glp1 and the sglt2 both ended up helping us with cardiovascular and renal risk reductions and that shifted the way we started treating of course doctors can never keep quiet we have all kinds of meetings and conferences then the discussion was which one is better glp1 is expensive sglt2 is it that better among the sglt2 which one to use you know all these things happen now the important thing is not about discussing these things at this point of time we have to understand that there are no available head to head randomized clinical trials 
comparing GLP-1 with SGLT-2 on cardiovascular outcome. So the current guidelines are silent about choosing between them. And the real-world studies probably support the use of SGLT-2 in patients with heart failure and chronic kidney disease and albuminuria. So the choosing between a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2, I'm sure, will become obsolete because of the mounting evidence supporting the addictive beneficial CV effects of using both of them. So today in the comprehensive care, it's very clear. It's not just the drugs. Your medications is going to be 25%. Most important thing is in comprehensive care, assess for the complications. Next, individualized goal setting of HPA1C and then shared decision making when it comes to starting off your drugs. Now, apart from using, the fight should not be about SGLT2 or just uh, GLP1, but it should always be about how do you see your patient, what should be the education, dietary counsel, individualizing target, regular follow-up, monitoring, etc., etc. So we have moved a long way, glucocentric to glucocentric plus no hypo, no weight gain, to use of drugs which probably help us in cardiovascular and renal approach. And this is where we are today. So if you quickly want to summarize only the drug management, first era, reduce HPA1C, self-line urea, insulin, second era, lower HPA1C without hypoglycemia, weight gain, use of bicarbonates, acarbose, and DPP4. Third era, lower cardiovascular risk, Biozolidones, TZDs in brackets here. Definite use of SGLT2 and GLP1 receptors in all your patients if there is, of course, no contraindication. So, this is my last line, the conclusion. The data is very, very convincing of usage of GLP1 and SGLT2. And these benefits seem to be predominantly independent of intensive glycemic control. So, there is a compulsive evidence to use either SGLT2 or GLP or maybe both of them in today's practice depending on your patient and importantly comprehensive and individualized care in all the patients. Just when I was closing down, I just got this particular one from diabetes care. Do we have to do away with our self-line ureas? Okay. So this clearly told us no, definitely there is no harm in comprehensive care as long as you are teaching your patients well about hypoglycemia, etc. It still has a large role to play. So thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you will have another three days of a long Diabetes India Congress to attend to and uh, wish all of you a, a great time at Indore, even though it, it's, it's pretty hot and sultry, I'm sure you can sit more often inside all the rooms because there are four halls so that it's going to be cool and then the science is going to be great. Thank you so very much.